Of course. He was very weak. And from midnight to three o'clock, after midnight, he was very, well, was a, perhaps a battle, an uh, internal battle. And then he said, only three weeks, only three births. Very weak, but understandable in Italian. Signore, ti amo. I haven't heard that because I was in bed. But the Polish version has heard it. And they, I must tell you, you must know that. And then we see, we have seen that it was 7 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. He was very, very weak. They come the doctors. And now he said, it's, I think it's, it may be the last day today. And it was the last day. 31, San Silvestre, 9, 34, he died. We were all gathered. Around his bed, and we prayed. And it was a, a very, very short uh, time when he was, before he died, he was not, not more aware. We've, we've prayed the uh, prayer of the classical prayers. Then I've given him the blessing and the absolution. And then, when we, we call, no, we have seen the Alma Mater, the Alma Redentoris Mater. That was the last moment. Yeah. Signore, ti amo, ti amo, you said, were his last words. That, that the use of that construction in Italian really suggests, doesn't it, a, a deep intimacy of that with our Lord. Would that be fair to say? Yes, yes. I think it was, it was a summary of his life, his personal life, his theological life, his intellectual life as a priest, as a cardinal, bishop, pope. It's all in, this, in these three words. You can, read, you can write a book, or two, or three, but the summary is that. And what is my, my opinion or my, my experience, not, not only my opinion, but my experience is that he lived not only but in a very, very, very near way the last years that was the title of his, of his life. And for me, personally for me, it was also a, a sign of God that he could die in the octave of Christmas. A very visible sign. Yeah. Was he prepared for his definitive encounter with God? I, I, I ask because we have a doctor of the church like Robert Bellarmine who wrote a whole treatise on Ars Morien dying well. It, it seems to me that uh, Pope Benedict was a master at the end of the Ars Moriendi, of, of how to die well. But I also want to read a quote that uh, in February of 2022, that quite soon he wrote, I shall find myself before the final judge of my life, even though as I look back on my long life, I can have great reason for fear and trembling. I am nonetheless of good cheer, for I trust firmly that the Lord is not only the last judge, but also the friend and brother who himself has already suffered from my shortcomings and is thus also my advocate, my paraclete. Could you reflect on that passage and how he prepared himself for the end? After his renunciation, he said, now it's the last part of my way, of my life, and I have to prepare me for the eternal encounter with Christ. And he was convinced that the last way would be very, very short. Once he said to me, 
if the good Lord is generous with me, perhaps a little year, perhaps at the end, not only one year, but ten years. Yes. And he was... Was he surprised by that? I mean, it is... <laughs> I think more than all, more than me. <laughs> right. And all the time, or all that time, was a way of purification, of praying, of reading, of meditation. And you could see from outside, he's there, but there is a, another reality present in him. And that reality was a... He spoke very, not very often about the, the death. And we know all, he wrote a very important book about the eschatology. So he was a, a specialist in that uh, theological discipline. He didn't speak about, but he did live life that. That was a, I think not only my impression, but everyone who could see him, speak with him, had had, had, had the same, the same impression. So, as he was preparing for death, and, and as, as I was just mentioning the Ars Mori Envy, what were some of your takeaways? What did you learn from, from this experience for your own life? Well, it was a very excess, a very intensive exercise for me. It was not, it was not very easy. But it was an exercise I have looked for. I didn't ask. It was a gift at the end. It was a gift for me. The main thing I have learned was now he is practicing that what he was teaching. To prepare himself to go on to, to the last goal of the life, to go on on the way to the eternity, to eternal life. And you've quoted the, it's my paraclet, my friend, my judge. But my impression was that he will go to a friend. And a friend to whom he was speaking, all the life, all his life was dedicated for Jesus as a professor or also then as a bishop later on in another way but very deeply and very convinced. convinced. And this impression for me, I think it, will, it was more than my studies in eschatology or in other uh, discipline, the, the logical disciplines. And I'm very thankful for that, grateful for that. Yeah. Well, in, in some ways to that, uh, he wrote an entire encyclical on Christian hope, Space Salvi. And he wrote in there, according to the Christian faith, redemption, salvation, is not simply a given. Redemption is offered to us in the sense that we have been given hope trustworthy hope by virtue of which we can face our present. The present, even if it is arduous, can be lived and accepted if it leads toward a goal. If we can be sure of this goal, and if this goal is great enough to justify the effort of the journey. How did he live that theological virtue in those last years? Before his renunciation, the word hope, it's not only a word, it's an attitude, it's a goal, it's a conviction. He 
Live that day by day, step by step. When he was emeritus, you could see that now the, the order of the worst steps of his life have a little changed. The hope came on the first place. I can only speak by my impression. Yes. Maybe I, I, I'm wrong, but that's my impression. Mm -hmm. And that was like a, 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 a good atmosphere. In a good atmosphere you can live well, because you can be sure whatever you do, it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. You have to seek the best, for myself or for himself, but also for the for the other one. And his, he quoted it, special his second encyclical is uh, for, the, I, for, for me it's the most important. Because that was, he opened his heart, he opened his mind, and with all the intellectual power and strength he had, he wrote that encyclical. And for himself, that was also like a navigation. That was the goal. And now, not, not only for others, mm -hmm. but exactly now for himself. Yeah. So did he express uh, specific desires or a plan uh, for what would follow? his passing, in other words, the, the funeral, the obsequies. What was his vision for that? In the testament, there is no word. You cannot find nothing in the testament about the day of the, or the, the place, or the, the writers, or the liturgy. And in all the days, in all the weeks, in all the years, he said, he said no word. But he was convinced there will be another one or others who will decide. Mm -hmm. I do not know if he had a desire, <laughs> right. but it was not expressed by him and not uh, before me. I do not know. But I am sure that he never spoke with uh, everyone about the, the funeral or about what be happened after the death. Yeah. So is that an act of humility? He had ten years to think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's. I'm sure that the humility was the last reason for that silence. Yeah. And was it too that um, what follows I will leave to others <laughs> to decide? I mean, it, it something that the, the surrendering again to those who followed. The only, the only, I re, if I remember very well, the only moment he spoke to me about death or about was when we read an article where he was not convinced that that article about the death is a good article. I will not quote the, the, <laughs> the author because, uh, no, only I will give my life and also my future life in the hand of God, in their good hands. And no other word about that theme. Did he request, or was it in his mind, uh, to be laid to rest in the very spot of his predecessor, of, of John Paul II? You know, the relation between John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger was, it was a, a tandem. Yeah. You mentioned two or three books earlier. I think we could have four or five just on that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And... There was a, a special relationship, and 
I've read that I think it's so that John Paul in a or in a letter or in a, in a speech he named him my friend mio amico mm -hmm. and it's for John Paul and also for Karl Ratzinger it's very that's very um, uh, a form to confess publicly their near relationship. And I think that, and we could see that in the, in the homily, one kind of writing, at the dean has made the homily for the funeral of his predecessor. There was a, 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 a very warm homily. Mm -hmm. in, in, if we cannot, I cannot forget it. It was in 2005, no, no, 90 years ago. And in that harmony you could see how near also the heart of Cardinal Ratzinger was to John Paul II. And that was not only a speech, a funeral speech or a funeral harmony like others, but it was an expression of his conviction and also a gratitude for all that he could have done as a prefect for the pontificate of John Paul II. He obviously uh, presided at the funeral. He helped guide uh, that entire process after the passing of John Paul II. I think he understood the, the enormity of John Paul's place in history. Here we have the passing now of an, of an emeritus pope, which is um, not unprecedented in the history of the church, but certainly uh, under these circumstances, uh, it was very, very different from anything we've seen in church history. What was the reaction to that passing then, given the uniqueness of his resignation or renunciation and then the 10 years that he spent? That's a good, that's a difficult, and that's a, a delicate question. Yes. I think because we hadn't had experiences, the first one. <laughs> and how behave, how celebrate, how make the liturgy. And we have sown and we have been, we have participated, have participated the funeral and the day was very, fra very, very cold, fog, uh, I remember you could not even see the, the dome of yes, St. Peter's. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think the weather was for perhaps the best guide for the situation on that day. <laughs> and it was a very simple liturgy, mm -hmm. a very simple funeral. And I have heard many, many voices, different voices, to be, on, to be honest. Yes. And we will see how history will, uh, what history will say to that day. Mm -hmm. But I think it's for him, as a very humble man, for him, in a certain way, it fits. I think that. But we will wait for the opinion of the history. Yes. We had to go all the way back, I think, to 1417 for a previous uh, resignation, and that was to end the Great Western Schism. We go back to the end of the 13th century with Pope Celestine V. One of the questions that's often asked relating to Celestine V is when he went to his tomb and placed the pallium. What was in your mind at that point? Where, were you, that was part of the schedule? Was that something that he chose to do? Was it in, extemporaneous? Uh, what was in his mind in doing that? You, we must see the context. It was the earthquake of L'Aquila, and it was clear that the Pope himself will go to L'Aquila. And that was fixed the date, and it was prepared, although the helicopter. That date, like the funeral, Awful, awful weather, 
and we had taken the car. And by car you need one hour, and by a helicopter half an hour. The pallium, it was, it, it, it was not a, a surprise. Benedict would honor his predecessor, the mm -hmm. V, giving him the pallium on his uh, body. And it was, it was very, very, it was n near impossible to go in the church because it was uh, very damaged by the earthquake. And at the beginning, there was also a, uh, a discussion. You have to, to, to take, a, 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 in Italian, it's a casco. What's that for the, for, uh, against, if, against the danger? You know? mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, that, no, I will, there will be the help of Salas in the fifth. That was a sign of gratitude, a sign of veneration, and I am sure it was not the first sign of a later renunciation. Right. We could write many, many things. The first time, the second time, and no, that was uh, that was that was not the intention of Pope Benedict. So to that, uh, I know you've been asked many times uh, when it first became clear to you that uh, he was going to renounce the papacy or resign from the papacy. Yes, I, when he said to me, that, that to me, uh, I was not perhaps not the first one, you know, but, but, but I was very against. And the Holy Father, it's impossible. Uh, you cannot resign. And I have made proposals, proposals, you can change that, 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 that. And you heard silence. And that he said, excuse me. I have told you, I remember well in Latin, not a question disputanda. <laughs> I've told you my decision. It's not to discuss now between you and me or others. I've told you a decision. In a very, in a very silent way. And when he was very silent, he was very, he was very clear. In that moment, I have understood, okay, uh, it will be not easy, but from that moment I, I helped him as possible. I could. That was in September 12, 2012, at the day of a, a Swiss saint, Saint Nicolas de Flue. Oh yes, yes, I know very well, uh, and I will not forget that. Uh. So before that, let's go back to those days of the passing of John Paul II and the conclave. It seemed heading into that conclave that he was an obvious favorite. He was more than just a papabile. He was somebody that it would have been a surprise had he not been elected pope. What were your thoughts at that point going into a conclave? Uh, did you think he would be elected? I'm sure that he was, he didn't want to be or elected Pope. But rebus extantibus, you could see that after two days, the Cardinals did not agree with him. <laughs> and I think he was he has done all to convince the cardinals or cardinals to elect a young woman. He said that also later on, and not him, with 78 years. And we know that he asked Pope 
John Paul II to give him the liberty from the prefect. Three times. And three times the Pope had that no. No, no. And we have heard yesterday that it was his, grand, his, his very deep desire to write, to finish his work about Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And for him it was the election, was the dead of the book at the beginning, the dead of the book. And the book is not only because he's a, a, a good writer or a good philosopher, a good theolo theologian. No, that was a confession. That was a testament. Writing that book, it was not because he wouldn't govern the church, but writing, it was a source of, of spiritual and intellectual strong. And then, the, the 19th of April, 2005, had changed totally his life. His life changed, but from your experience of having been his secretary at that point for, what, two years? Yes. How did it change him, or did it? Personally, there was no change. Cardinal Ratzinger? and Pope Benedict, the same person. A bigger apartment. Yeah. <laughs> a bigger apartment, all, although the, you know from the purpura and the white, the, the outfit was a little, a little uh, different. Yes. But his person, his personality, uh, to live with him, there was no change. Of course, the ministry, the petrol ministry, it was then uh, uh, another schedule, uh, other responsibilities. But it was like before, before I, and he was a cardinal, mm -hmm. till, the, till the, la the last day as a Pope Emeritus. Mm -hmm. Also, as a Pope Emeritus, he didn't change his way, and of course, getting weak, always weaker, but the personality was the same. Talk about the, as somebody who had reflected uh, theologically and spiritually on the Petrine office, for him to assume it, what was that like for him? Pope Benedict, was a servant for 24 years of his predecessor. And at the, the origin, he has written much about the primacy, primacy, about the council. And I could see that, remember his writings, that he was looking for realize what he was writing. And as a prefect, he could, he had a very near contact with a living Pope. And that contact, I think, has prepared him also, at least a little bit, for his being Pope. The universal pastor of the church. And as a servant, he has done what he, he said many times, I serve the church. I serve, I serve God with my life, with the gifts I've become from, from God. I know I'm not perfect, but he served by, with, with the whole heart and with all his strength till the last day till it was not more possible for him to serve as a, the, the first pastor as a pope 
and therefore he was convinced I have to give back the primacy in the hand to God. Yeah. In his retirement, uh, he said Mass and he wrote homilies. I know that I, I, my understanding is that those will eventually be published. I think many of us who had followed him for years were praying that that would somehow, that some, some way you had managed to hang on to those. What was that experience like? Uh, because I know that he, he dedicated himself to those homilies. So what was that experience? Not only as a Pope Emeritus, he gives homilies, private homilies, but also in the, in the years of his uh, papacy, we have about 30, I think 30, 25, 30 homilies in the chapel of the Palazzo Apostolico or also in Castel Gandolfo. For only there was uh, my, the both secretary and the mem memories and sometimes a, a guest or guests. We could see that he, that was a sort of gratitude for the persons about him, uh, around of him, around him, <laughs> and we didn't, my, we didn't, never expect or asked him, Holy Father, excuse me, can you can you take a homily tomorrow because you're in, in our chapel? Then, as a emeritus, after. Two months. The first month was very, very different, very, very difficult. Then the strength went back, and then in the monastery Mater Ecclesiae, he began. And about five years. Uh, when the voice was very weak, or more weak, weaker and weaker, it was not more possible to register his homilies. Mm -hmm. But he, the, he read the gospel Sunday evening for the next Sunday. And all the week he meditated. Saturday morning from 10 to 12, he wrote a homily, basically for you. I wrote, and then he, but he preached uh, without, and only for us. For us, it was. I have spoken with the memory. Of them. He will, I cannot say, Holy Father, it's not necessary that you. No, he lived in the Holy Spirit. He lived in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy uh, Scripture, mm -hmm. and. Uh, if it was possible for him to preach or for four or for 40,000, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That was our experience. Yeah. And now we will see uh, what came out. Uh, what did he say? Yeah. Even then in retirement, even as uh, he declined, he was still putting all of his gifts uh, and his, his vast experience of the years of reflection, study, and prayer, even then into these homilies, to the service of the church, uh, to the service of Christ. I think so. But I have to confess, he didn't know that we have registered uh, the, the homilies. <laughs> that you'd save them. No, it, it was, uh, but for me it was clear. My, it, it, it's a pity when, when we not can uh, write that later on. And I've, I don't know it's a sin or it's not a sin. I have, <laughs> uh, okay, when that's a sin, I, I have to confess. But if, uh, um, I was convinced that it will be a great gift for all people can read or hear that yeah. harmonies. Well, in, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, there are two pressing matters that I want to ask. We, we've had in the discussions here over the last two days at this conference uh, whether or not Benedict uh, would eventually become a doctor of the church. And there are two requirements, three technically in terms of the formal announcement by the church, but two key ones. Uh, the first is the canonization declaration of 
sainthood, and the other is clear eminence of teaching. I think we can safely say that there is a clear eminence of, of teaching, that this is a body of work that will, through the centuries, I think, we'll, we're, we're going to continue to reflect on. Did he live the virtues heroically? I am convinced that he will be a saint yeah. and with his doctrima eminence, with his teaching, later on, or together, he will be also a doctor of the church. That's my personal, and also my wish, of course. <laughs> no? I'm, right. I'm very subject, of course. No? But we have other people here that are much deeper in his writings and better theologians than me. But who read him? Who have heard his homilies, his meditations, his catechesis? There is a, a deepness and a very rich for the personal spiritual life. And therefore, I hope, I pray, and I be, I've, I'm convinced that he will be saint and also a doctor of the church. Yeah. At some time in the future, but uh, we never know when. Uh, it, it took, I know, uh, I think it was Albert the Great many centuries to receive the title. In his spiritual testament, he wrote, and, and bear with me, for 60 years now I have accompanied the path of theology especially biblical studies, and have seen seemingly unshakable theses collapse with the changing generations, which turned out to be mere hypotheses. The liberal generation, the existentialist generation, the Marxist generation. I have seen and see how, out of the tangle of hypotheses, the reasonableness of faith has emerged and is emerging anew. Jesus Christ is truly the way, the truth, and the life. And the church in all her shortcomings is truly his body. I think it's important to give that last word for this conference to the centrality of Christ in the life of Benedict the Sixteenth. And in the just a minute or so that we have left, if you could just help us to understand that one last time. The fact that Benedict these words has written in his testament, at the end of the testament, shows us how important is that the doctrine of the church, not philosophic or theological theses, are the base you can put your feet, you can base your life. And therefore, for him, it was very, very important to help people, saying that he, as a great theologian, has lived many, many great theories, at the end, was nothing. It's only the church with the teaching, the teaching that Christ, Christ is the truth, the way, and for him it was all that in the three last words, Signore, ti amo. Therefore, you have quoted the Testament, and I have now quoted his last words. I think it was a synthesis of the synthesis of the Testament. Yes. Lord, I love you. Yeah. Well, Archbishop Gainsfine, thank you so much uh, for your time today. And uh, thank you for your years of dedicated service. Thank you.